Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Langley. And I'm Mark Langley. This week's podcast, uh, we're going to chat to Mark about some of his experiences with horses and where he gets his some of his quite strong philosophy on how you should train a horse. This is quite specific to the young horse starting clinic that he's just done and, and his response to a horse that came through that had some training that he felt hadn't helped that horse in any way. So I wanted to him to just kind of divulge a little bit more about his own personal experiences, about what he'd seen and what has led him to come to the position that he now feels quite strongly on with certain types of training. So it might be helpful to some of you listening and it might be interesting as well to hear these stories. Right. Okay, um, I guess I was just going back to sort of thinking about what was the the day that I gave myself three uppercuts and a slap across the face and went, how come you didn't see that? And, and, and I remember a particular, I don't exactly remember the exact horse, but it was a wild horse, whether it was a Brumby or just a, uh, an unhandled horse that got jumped off a truck. Either way, it was a, it was a pretty touchy sort of, you know, unhandled style of horse and really, really two eye on horse, hyper focused face up, um, you know, those horses I found over the years, they're the ones that really protect their back end and you could probably get a hand, you know, get a sniff of them, but they won't let you pass their eyes. And, um, and I was always really, really curious about a horse's eyes and, and how, you know, how, how it processed this on one side versus the other and how one eye would focus stronger, uh, to go to destinations than the other eye and yeah, different things like that. And why it had a nervous eye versus a more curious eye. Um, and it was all just, I guess, the processing and using different windows for different sides of the brain, I, su- I suppose. But but going back to that particular horse, I I still had incorporated, though over the years I was kind of trying to sort of adjust from being real heavy and pushy in the round pen and drivey and, and that, because that's, you know, I guess, you know, but working on a horsemanship ranch in America and seeing other training and even myself like, going on and looking at other trainers and watching how they train just a video here and there, I'd, I'd go, oh, yeah, well, that's what people seem to do and I'd try They were all bit. doing it. Yeah, and I'd try a bit, but then very quickly the horses were saying, you've got to sharpen up, mate. Uh, you've, you know, you've got so many lessons to, to get me started for, for this person and you, you're going to run out of time if you keep, um, you know, doing this. Um, that's what I was saying to myself, but the horses were telling me very quickly, don't, you know, you can't fix your own mistakes all the time. You have to sort of improve the horse every lesson you have. Um, and and the biggest thing was the trust thing. But, but this particular horse I was working, I let it go. I tried to send it, just, you know, create a bit of pressure with a flag or um, or a wavy rope. I can't even remember. And I just sort of you know, just keep hyper-focusing. And then I'd get a little bit bigger and the horse would just sort of freeze and back off and... and and I couldn't get it to move out on a circle without going to sort of ballistic and absolutely kind of looking like I was going crazy and just chase it. This horse would just hyper focus on me, and I'm like, I put it on a lead. I try to do it on a lunge, and and I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to go to just huge to frighten this horse enough that it just runs around frantic. Uh, it wasn't in me to do that, and I guess there was something in me that wasn't in me was it wasn't in me to put that much stress on horses just to get them to move their feet. So anyway, I just got this horse by the rope and I just kind of led it. And I realized all these, all, all the, you know, clients that I talked to about, you know, this horse, I had to get, go careful down its sides to get it to trust me on both sides. And I'd go down the, the sides of a horse working on a bit of an approach and retreat and until I could get all the way down to the hip and they were pretty comfortable well, anyway, I just went, well, I'm just going to stand here and just, oh, I'm going to walk, no, sorry, I'm going to walk backwards and I'm just going to lead that eye just past my shoulder a little bit and just let you walk beside me for a bit and see if you can just just even just hold one eye a little bit more on me than the other eye. And I just said, you just walk there and I'll walk off to the side. and Oh, sorry, I'll walk here and you walk off to the side and we'll walk like that for a bit. 
and then I saw the horse's expression change and it softened a little bit, much as uh, like that, like a bit like when you go down their sides and they soften. And anyway, as it softened, it its walk softened and it and it released a bit of a sort of a, a like it felt like a forward thought. It was going forward instead of sort of being standoffish and bracing back into the lead. So it was like this moment: the horse in the in the front uh, part of its eye, its its left eye, it just started to soften, like its whole eye softened. But what I'm saying, it could see me on that eye, and and I was at the front of that eye, but I wasn't uh, right in front of it with two eyes on. It softened and just kind of breathed a little softer, and then just walked and had a forward thought, and then. I just let it walk in that spot for a bit and then I asked a bit more and then all of a sudden the eye came past me a little bit and then it got to a point that the side of the eye was on me and it softened and it breathed and it got a forward thought and it, and it continued that forward thought and I'm like, oh. And then it just went past me and then it, by that stage the back part of the eye was on me and I was further behind its jaw and it just breathed and went out and it went out and did a whole circle around me and just walked around in a circle without, without hyper-focusing, facing up. And I, and I said, as I said earlier on, that was the moment I gave myself three uppercuts and said, how come you didn't see that all the horses you were crawling down their side watching the eye change and all you could have done was get them to do it for you instead of you go down their side? And that was the day that I pretty well knew the answer where I wanted to go with do I keep cutting corners with driving pressure or do I master guiding a horse and leading them? And building them. And, and building their confidence through them making good decisions, you know, because I say this to a lot of people, when you're working really tough, nervous horses, they will train you to be an absolute guru until someone else can't go near them, but they'll trust you and they'll go anywhere with you. But in any other environment, they'll, they'll get anxious because of all the other people in the environment that they haven't learned to trust with their energy. Because with the super sensitive, nervous horses, you get so tuned into their anxiety that actually you actually uh, stop at the right moments and you know how to sort of help them out and this and that and the other. And, and, and they, they'll have you trained to be, to be a, a nervous horse specialist um, in the sense of you are good at around nervous horses, but the nervous horse is never involved to be confident horses. So just a bit of background then with, um, with Mark's um, history, for those of you that might be a bit new to him, he started out um, professionally starting horses um, out in rural Australia and was sent horses generally off the back of a truck that had never been handled before. Um, and over the course of about 10 years, he started well over a thousand horses and got quite a reputation because he was able to take, well, he took on all horses and so people would send him um, sometimes quite difficult ones that other trainers um, hadn't been able to or wouldn't touch. Um, and so his experience was quite broad uh, in terms of what he was doing and the types of horses he was getting. A considerable portion of them were ex extraordinarily nervous, wild and sort of the flighty horses. He did a lot of Arabs, for example. Um, and so that experience was quite unique in some senses because it was just him training in Australian bush um, by himself and really just him and the horses um, getting to know each other, uh, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Um, so very vigorous training and, you know, trying to do the right thing by the horses, but obviously always on a timeline. As anyone in the horse industry knows, you've always got that pressure of, of time behind you. It's, it's tied up with the sort of cost to the client. Um, and so what happened then? So you developed this way of doing things in a slightly different way. And, and now if we fast forward um, almost 30 years, um, you're still beating that drum of, look, guys, we don't need to be doing some of these training things because, you know, you know, you know, it's not right for horses. Um, but people are still doing it. Lots of these training methods are still very, very, very common. And I suppose there'll be a lot of people out there listening will go, what's what I'm doing? I've seen other people do. It's all out there. And I don't see what's wrong with it. Is there a scenario you can give me where you can just sort of talk about um, a particular type of training that you've walked away from, uh, you've changed because you've seen the effects that it does? Is there one that you can outline? Oh, the big, the biggest one I talk about, and you know, people say me talk about driving pressure, and you know, um, there's times that you need to step up and and drive a bit for certain things. But um, what what people have done is they've relied on it. So 
one of the biggest things that I really try and steer people away is the whole idea of drive and draw. Um, so drive and draw is you move up, move your energy up into the horse. They move away from your energy, and then um, then when you got when you want to get their attention, you might step across their eye and draw them in. Uh, people use that at liberty in the in in any techniques that you know some sort of hooking on type technique or or you know join up whatever you want to call it. They 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 push the horse out and then they draw it in. Um, with their body language. With their body language, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it creates like this um, vacuum um, that that kind of almost sucks the horses in and makes them overface and, and follow us around. And um, the problem with it, 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 it sets you up. For, like I, 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 I do a I, – there's a saying that I say, I said you don't want to get stuck in the revolving door of drive and draw. And it is a revolving draw, door. And why I say it's a revolving door is because – one day you're in an emergency, you have to run out in the paddock and catch your horse. You're jogging down the paddock to catch your horse. The horse sees that driving energy rushing towards it. It runs off and then you've got to stop and go, oh, hang on a minute. Now come over here. I'm going to draw backwards and take the energy off you and you're going to hook on and follow my energy back in. Okay, so people get stuck with nervous horses because every time they're, they're, they're hurried or they're having a bad day or they're walking up to their horse, and they're walking up with a different energy towards their horse. The horse gets kind of worried about it, and then, then to to compensate for that, they got to step away and draw the horse back in. And all these kind of nervous brumbies, um, you know, any horses that are very sensitive, they tune into every footfall we make, every everything. And if we start to get them tuned in, the the fact that our energy is going to push them out, and then when we relax our energy, they're going to relax, and when we step away, they're going to relax. That means the only thing that relaxes those horses and makes them feel better is take away the pressure, take which means us. they never can cope with pressure. So mm-hmm. those horses like the Brumbies, you know, Brumbies that I see that have been, um, you know, the ones that like I've seen so many of them being taught to face up, hook on, and they're already facing up and hooking on like the horse that we just spoke about that, you know, took me ages to get it to just walk past my shoulder. But um how am I supposed to pick up a tie and foot if it can't walk past me if it's too if it's hooking on with two eyes all the time? So, um, so what what happens is you get stuck in this rut, and then all of a sudden, when you take that horse into a clinic environment, say even if you just or a vet, you go to the vet, and there's three or four people around vet nurses. As soon as there's more people around and all those different energies doing different things, the horse is so paranoid of all this energy bouncing around it that it just ends up in this kind of frantic space. Because we taught it to be paranoid of energy, we, we pick our energy up, we push our energy in, you have to be aware of that and move away from that. And when I relax my energy and I draw away from you, I'm going to lure you into my, you know, niceness. And, and it, and, and it kind of what it does, it, it creates the, um, the I'm, I'm, I'm the witch in um, Hansel and Gretel. I'm going to, you know, here's my lolly house and come in and now I'm going to lock you up and eat you. Um, so... It's it's kind of, but the the biggest thing I say is that it it causes horses to only relax in release, and horses need to relax under pressure, through pressure, from pressure, not uh, always relax just because we've taken the pressure away. And and unfortunately, um, you know that really sets them up to only relax when you when you when you back off and you drop your energy and pressure. So the Brumby that came on the clinic, the young horse studying clinic, I will just mention him briefly because he had had that kind of training background. He had had yeah. a lot of drive and draw from what the owner was saying from from the from the different people that had handled him yeah. in different situations, trying to get him on a float even. So um, what could you see in that horse that um, you that you would have? Um, you know, your training would have done differently. What what was it that sort of we went, ah, oh, you know, what was he doing? What were the signs? Okay, the one of the biggest signs I think, and and, and I think the owner did a great job because um, she's been learning herself t- to to help this horse feel better. So when something really didn't feel right to her, she moved away from it um, and and tried someone else to get some help. Um, so that that's that's really good. And what she'd done had, had had still he still had an interest and trust in people. So. You could tell that, you know, there was that trust. But the biggest thing I think that I, I wanted to, to address with him was the fact that he he, he was a horse that got used to overfacing um, or running off But but he's because uh, he'd had a bit of the, you know, the, the, the hooking on, send him around and get him to face up, send him around, get him to face up. So what he would do, he would face up. 
and he put us two eyes on and that was his sort of safe decision, two eyes on so you're safe. But then he couldn't cope with people coming in from different angles and then he got to a stage that uh, he would start to play the game of facing up but then he wouldn't like people going past his eye because down his side he was nervous and I know at a previous place um, they had a bit of trouble catching him and it was someone else who was needing to catch him too and uh, and it caused a bit of a spook skedaddle in him where he'd, he'd just sort of suddenly be ready for the catch and then, then bolt again. But then he'd kind of run off and then he'd probably face up again and just end up with your back at the front of him again. So so it, it caused the, 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 the sending around and facing up causes a, a, an anxiety to face up and, and think that's the answer, that's what they have to do. The other thing is every time I asked him to lead past me, he'd speed up and go out on a circle but the funny thing was is I would loosen the rope and even if I wasn't in a small yard, he would still stay on a circle. So he'd been circled that many times thinking that was the answer, circle and face up, circle and face up. Uh, so I couldn't control the speed. He was still quite anxious down his sides. Um, you know, I had to really work on him trusting that he could process information coming from me down his side and be quiet and slow in his movement while he does things, not just rush because energy's coming at him all the time. So when you were working, starting your horses in a different way, you were starting to use these new techniques uh, and you were starting to also look at their horses, uh, how they were processing and where their thoughts were and all of that sort of interplayed into just training in a very sort of holistic way as opposed to just moving their body around, which I think you had been doing originally. Mm. Um what did you notice um, once you started to sort of train in that in that more encompassing way? What what were the um, benefits to the horses then that you could see as opposed to someone another horse that you would you would teach that had had a different background? Um, in terms of how responsive they were, how soft they were, what were the? Okay, well, there's 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 the 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 emotional or mental side of it, and then there was the physical side. Um, so what 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 happened was is the horses. Um, one of the biggest things I noticed was they could process my information without a high level of anxiety. They they still sometimes needed awareness, but they didn't become paranoid about the information coming from me. So they, they actually got so much better at being aware of the situation, as in where I am, where the rope's going, the fence that's there, the things that are around them, they, they had more confidence to process their whole environment, not just hyper-focus on the person in the middle moving them and the energy that's coming at them. So, so by, by um, so, so, you know, when people talk about your horse has got shallow breathing, uh, a horse has got shallow breathing because they're kind of tense, uh, they're all braced in the base of the neck and their shoulders are tight and their front feet are tight and they're kind of bound up in the hind quarter and they're moving high-headed, very stiff, because they're very alert, they're very nervous and, and they're kind of looking for the danger all the time. So once they realised that I could guide them in a way that didn't make them feel under threat or danger, they started to search, they'd sniff the ground, they'd sniff the things that they're going to, they'd process uh, thing, uh, all the things. like so, so basically what I sort of say to people is your horse is hyper-focused on the question, it's not searching for the answer. And they go, what do you mean? It's like, well... They're just staring at the question. They're staring at your stick or you standing there going, you have to move me. And I'm like, the horse is not searching. I'm asking a question. And the, instead of the horse looking for the answer going, oh, does he want me to look over there? Does he want me to back up? They just look at where the pressure comes from and say, you must put pressure on me so I can move off pressure. Mm -hmm. So they end up stop searching. So basically what happens is the horses end up carried by pressure and they don't think away. They don't think about the answer, as I say, they're thinking about the question like it's a big, bold question, but they're not even looking at it. They're just staring at the question. So they're not processing. They're not searching. They're not thinking. Their whole world actually caves in around yeah, them until this point where they're aware of the human and pressure yep. and not much else. Yeah, yeah. And so all their natural instincts have been sort of uh, taken away from them and they become this shell that not only you see as being quite yeah. braced, but also like quite unhappy yeah yeah so, so some of the chronic horses that i get like i say chronic as, as i've had horses that were sort of super apparently fancy you know show liberty horses and i call them chronically braced horses because they're hyper focusing at me and the possible stick that i might have to send them on their fancy circles and stuff and one of the biggest things that helped them the most is 
I spend an hour just saying, can you look away from me? And they go, no, I can't. I must not. I must not. I must not look away. Yeah. And, and I say, but you can. Look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wave my hand or I'm going to wave a flag. I'm going to wave something that stresses you a little. And when you're a little stressed, can you look away? And they go, no, I can't. I must not. And it just, and, and, and just to see the hyper focus on that horse, um, not, but, and, and then all of a sudden they look away and go, oh, I've just looked away. And then I've just looked back and he's still there with a smile on his face. I haven't done anything wrong. Oh, maybe I'm allowed to go towards my thoughts, not just always move away from my thoughts um, and move away from pressure. And, and, and I've seen horses just unlock so much and they sniff the ground, they breathe, they, they just go, oh, thank God, I can, I can, I can actually process my environment. And, um, and I had a horse one time at a clinic up in Queensland and it was an endurance horse or going to be an endurance horse. And uh, she luckily got a spot on the second clinic because we made a little bit of headway on the first clinic, but the second clinic was what kind of really nailed it and, and got the horse soft. The whole first clinic, she said, my horse is spooky outside. Why is it spooky outside all the time? I'm like, it's paranoid. She goes, well, it's it's kind of looking for danger outside all the time. It's kind of looking around all the time and it gets really anxious. And I'm like, yeah, but look at it in the groundwork. I said, it's looking for ne- where the next stick's going to jump out. I said, what have you done? And she told me and I said, well. What has she done? Well, she did sort of training where you put a stick out and the horse moves off the stick and then you put a stick out the other way and it moves off the other way and, and then you teach it to move around you know with sticks you move its hind quarter with a stick you move its whole court which with doesn't a stick. sound nasty it sounds like you're dancing with it's, a horse it's kind of it's kind of what you see in that movie training sort of stuff you know mm-hmm. sticks to get them to rear and i call mm-hmm. it i call it stickmanship it's mm-hmm. kind of like gets the horses to hyper focus on where the little stick's going to pop up and then all of a sudden they just get paranoid about the pop-up sticks right so again the horse isn't allowed to make its own decisions and search because it's all about where the stick is and it moving off the stick off the pressure it's it's all about moving off the pressure and just looking for where the next pressure is so i said to her i said i said i can't get this horse to not hyper focus and just move away from energy or the feeling of energy so i said we've got to get this horse to take one soft step in lead rope and until it can take one soft soft step in lead rope and then just look away then it it's it's going to be you know tricky. So so what happens with that paranoia of the groundwork? The horse would go out on a ride and be like looking everywhere, like there's dangers around because there's something going to pop out somewhere and I have to move because that's the way it was geared in the groundwork to 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 mentally operate is where where is it coming from? Where is it coming from? So then that's why it became a paranoid riding horse outside. So so then what we did in the groundwork. It finally let go in the groundwork and get said, "Ah, oh, I can look away. I can go towards my thoughts. I can I can have you there, and then think about what's in front of me." Um, and then it sort of let go of all that paranoia in some lessons on the ground. And then when she rode it in the arena, the horse went, "Ah, oh, I can walk softly. I can look around. I don't have to keep looking back." And and then that was the change that made that horse just about ready to say, "Well, okay, you now you can ride it out without paranoia." So so basically education and, and pressure is just information it, it shouldn't be like it's just a you know so that's why i say to people like it's not about just pressure and release it's a bit more subtle than that it's about you know the horse following the path of least resistance not looking for danger with its eyes um and i i think i think what's happened over the years is people have harnessed the power of the horse's eye too much mm-hmm. and they haven't harnessed the power of everything else that, that the horse uses. So so basically it, what I'm saying, harnessing the power of the eye to focus on the question all the time is taking away the eye's ability to look around as well. Do you think that it's partly to do with the way that we talk to each other? When I'm having a conversation with you, we're looking at each other. Yeah. Our eyes are, but, but when you're having a conversation with a horse training it, I suppose the humans want to see that face. They want yeah. to see, but it doesn't need to be that way, yeah. does it? Yeah, and there was something that sort of, I think even if you look at the roots of horsemanship, some of the old timers that would have, you know, like brought it to the public a bit, like, you know, you, you hear the, the, the words of Tom Dorrance around and then and then there's this whole lineage that comes from that. And I think if you look back to the old stuff, there was less body language and it was just more of a, a subtle kind of, you know, when it was a job for the horses, the horses had to go to work. They were work horses. They didn't have time to dance around round yards and, mm-hmm. and do showmanship stuff. 
and I, I like I don't want to be overcritical, but I would say some of the energy stuff and the uh, I'm not saying liberty is a bad thing. Liberty done right's a good thing, mm. but all that energy work and get the horse to watch and hyper focus and and watch your energy and tune in with you and all this sort of stuff. It got overdone to a to a to a, to a so much so that 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 the horses they people disabled their horses by having them too, too focused and hooking on to all these ideas um, because everyone wanted to do it without a rope on because that was really cool and, and that looks really cool, you know. But, uh, you know, but it's not really cool if your horse flips over backwards when you're tied it up. Yeah, or spins on the trail Yeah, right. and, and I've had that times where I've had, had horses that done a lot of eye stuff and then they panic when you pull on the head or they – but they can do these amazing eye tricks – uh, with their owners and it's like well hang on this is a holistic approach and for me I was training horses for the general public for for, for cattle men and women for you know endurance riders trail riders um, the horse had to survive a whole experience not just a dancing around a round yard experience yes yeah that's right okay so it goes back to pressure then their ability to be able to cope with pressure yeah so um, someone putting a lot of pressure on a horse in a round yard, doesn't it over time get used to that pressure and feel okay with it? It depends on the pressure and the outcome. So um, I, I made a joke uh, when I was in the States and, 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 and you know, like, like Australians, uh, you know, the American society, freedoms are, you know, it's an important thing to, to, to them. And, and, and I said, nobody over here is going to like me because if you bought a round yard off me and I was selling round yards, You'd have to do a degree on how not to uh, stuff up your horse before you're allowed to buy it. Wow. So I would take your freedom off you about buying a round yard, and I, I, I just said it as a joke. But I wanted people to think about how many horses I've seen that people just bought a round yard and a flag, and had them nearly climb in the rails of a fence trying to climb out mm-hmm. in fear. Um, so, so for me, it was like you know. I use a flag, but I'm very cautious to when I teach people to say the flag is for these specific things. Don't just use it as a crutch. Don't use a round yard as a crutch. If you just get a flag and you're using the flag as a crutch and you get in a round yard and use the round yard as a crutch, then you're just trapping the horse in an endless bolt around, 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 around yard, moving away from danger. And you can fry them very quickly. And as we say, we, we started the conversation a bit more on Brumbies and wild sensitive horses. Mm. You start doing that with those horses, you're going to get in a mess. So maybe buy yourself a, a square yard just so you can't send it round and round and round and round. Mm. Just to sort of, you know, I'm not not trying to talk about square yards or round yards being better one or the other, but I'm just saying if there's a, so much danger that can be done, you've got to know the pitfalls before you step in and go, I want to do the amazing things. Um, so like uh, my saying a lot in, you know, when you're loading a horse, teach it to unload first. When you put a horse in the long reins, you're teaching it to get out of trouble before you take it out the gate and get it into trouble. Mm-hmm. Okay, so everything we're doing, we're working out what is the biggest problems that's going to happen and where's the horse going to struggle. How can we avoid those um, or not avoid them but but teach the horse to be able to get out of trouble. So if we know the negative effects of a round yard, then we can go in and try and focus on the positive things or the positive outcomes we want to do. Right, yeah, so you avoid the pitfalls. Yeah, and that's why I'm trying like, – my, my training may sound negative sometimes and I don't want to sort of uh, – I don't want to make people scared of my training because, oh, you know, it's not all positive positive in the sense that, hey, let's try this, hey, let's try this. I'm saying maybe don't do that. Um, mm. But what I've found is I had to work out in the past myself – to be very efficient and effective with horses and not waste time, not waste clients' money, was how do I avoid the pitfalls and the negative effects of training? Not, oh, I'd like to do that, let's do that. Yes, because essentially you had that three weeks, 15 lessons to get them to a certain point. And so like you said, every lesson had to be a a progression from the last in order to get your horse ready. And so if the training wasn't right, if it wasn't suitable, if it was damaging to them, if they were struggling with pressure because they didn't like it, if it was increasing their anxiety, if it was making them a bit more shut down, they're less likely to learn and they're less likely to progress. Mm. So if you're, for you, am I right in saying that your evidence really for what you, the way that you were training and the what, things that you were changing, your evidence for that was that 
the horses they benefited they progressed amazingly well and you were really happy with how soft they were at the end of those 15 lessons yeah, yeah. and 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 if i knew sometimes then what i know now there's horses that i would have done a little bit differently on um you know they in the majority of all the tough ones that i did they all ended up responding well and soft and there's still a few that i think back now i thought i would have done that a bit differently now but at the time i was only doing what i knew best and and with all the information that i had yeah and and as that's that's all we're trying to do we're only doing what we know and but i had a strong desire to change something in me and what i was doing to improve so so that's what kept me searching and and um kind of experimenting a little bit with uh you know going away from what what seemed like the norm how is how do you feel seeing so many other horse trainers out there so well known um so well followed by by many many people for long periods of time but doing what you've believed to be fundamentally wrong by horses how does that make you feel uh it's it's hard um because um it's like pyramid marketing um so so i could sell someone a product that's easy to apply and that's why flags driving pressure using a flag and driving pressure or a stick and driving pressure very easy to apply you get a result very quickly it you don't have to you don't have to work on a lot of technique just a little bit and like if i gave you know a five-year-old kid a flag and say you shake the flag on that side of the horse the horse is probably going to go the other way Mm -hmm. so it's very easy to apply so people get quick results they can do their one two three fours very quickly so i can see why people get get right into it um because they make quite a lot of progress but I've met so many people over the years that they've got to a certain level of a program and said, I really got stuck after that level. And I said, well, yeah, because everything was easy to apply. It was on obedience and all this sort of stuff. And I said, but when you picked up that knot on that lead rope to get that horse to step across, that one step is leading to level six. And because that one step didn't have enough softness and lift and life and purpose in it, it just was an obedient move away from pressure. The horse ended up on its forehand, a bit shut down or a lot shut down or whatever. Braced. And now now the brace is through the whole body and the mind mm-hmm. and the horse is too braced for level six. Mm-hmm. So you're stuck. So anyway, but how I feel about it is what worries me the most is if there's one big person, then it's 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 like any pyramid sort of thing. You got you got a you got someone at the top and then you got the mini me's and then the mini me's under them mm-hmm. and what i get concerned about is 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 if people aren't conscious about how their horse is feeling in in education if they're not conscious about uh you know where the horse's thoughts are how it can process the information the 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 physical and mental benefits of good training um and they're just looking at the obedience and all that sort of stuff and they're not looking at the other stuff then what I worry about, because I get so many shut down horses that have like, and I don't want to be critical of natural horsemanship, but I, I kind of will be honest and say, yeah, okay, there's the shut down performance horses and the broken performance horses. There's the, there, there's the, all these horses, but I didn't realize when I started doing clinics that I'd have all these broken horsemanship horses because horsemanship was supposed to be for the horse. Yeah. It was there. The original intention of those old guys that were sending the message out was we're here to help our horses feel better in information. We've got to start to understand what our horses need a bit more. Um, but then everyone in the name of horsemanship is selling a product that's easy to apply. Or a method. In, in, in a method. And and what I've noticed is is what saddens me the most is I get all these broken horses come through horsemanship and the intention of that wasn't to break horses like it has uh but the problem is, is it's such a big business that you've like, by the time you get to the top of the, the to the bottom of the pyramid, you've got the one at the top, you might have tens of thousands of horses at the bottom underneath the people at like the, just the general public training. So the effect is, is not just on one horse, that, that one trainer who's got that big method, it's not on the horses that he's trained, it's, it's on all the thousands of people that that message has gone through yes and and then the people they help in their in in their neighbor and then that neighbor helps another person and they say oh we'll just get around yard and chase it around a bit and i see that so much i was at an adjustment center doing a clinic and i always laugh on the weekend because the adjustees come and i laugh in a cynical way 
because I'll be talking about the effects of driving pressure and round penning. And as we're doing the clinic, the round pen is kind of at the end of the arena and the the one adjuster comes in, chases their horse around a bit, gets it to face up, chases it the other way, puts it back in the paddock, goes back home. Next one comes in, does the same thing, and I'm like, see? I said, you know, I'm here telling you guys alternatives to just sort of sending a horse around, and but it's so common everywhere. On your clinics, you take 10 horses. Out of those 10 horses, how many have a shutdown and seriously affected by what you've been talking about? I'd say sometimes it's 10. I've done some clinics where the whole lot, uh, you walk up to them with energy, they're looking, what are you doing? Uh, or they're shut down and, they, and, they've, and they're responsive to driving pressure. I've had eight out of ten horses a lot. Uh, they're, they're over-responsive and paranoid to driving pressure. Uh, so as soon as you stop, they shut down a bit and then as soon as you uh, – and then there's others that are just green and pushy. And so you might have a clinic with five of those horses and then you might have uh, – and sometimes you might only have two or three at a clinic that are kind of the hyper, you know, nervous – from driving pressure but because it's in every discipline in some respect like lunging has become a bit of a just send them out on a circle and they mightn't even be doing horsemanship but they just send them around 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 hoping that they'll wear them down on a circle Um, and i'm not against lunging i'm not against sending a horse out on a circle it's just the way you do it and and how the horse is processing the information and how good it feels and um how well it's carrying itself on on those things and is is it has to be addressed otherwise it's just a waste of time it's such a prevalent issue um thank you for your honesty in this session and no it's not easy to be that honest um when you're going against the grain and um i think i can speak for everyone else that's listening or hopefully most people listening that we appreciate your voice thank you mark thank you if you enjoyed listening to the podcast, please leave us a comment. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast, please leave us a comment. Uh, we'd like to uh, read them. We'd be interested to hear your opinions and um, certainly help answer questions in future podcasts if they come up. Uh, leaving a comment, liking, sharing also really helps other people to find this podcast and it might just help a horse. You've been listening to Australia's very own Mark Langley a horseman with many insights from his decades of dabbling. marklangley.com.au